podcast on Power Talk AM 1460 and FM 101.1, streaming worldwide on iHeartRadio. Jan Price talks to the movers and shakers in the film business. The Jan Price Show. My guest today is Anne McCabe, and Anne is an editor who started in the cutting rooms of Woody Allen, Brian De Palma, and Sidney Lumet. She also worked closely with Kenneth Lonergan on the Academy Award-nominated film, You Can Count on Me. Her latest project is Can You Ever Forgive Me, starring Melissa McCarthy and Richard E. Grant. Welcome to the show, Anne. Thanks for having me, Jan. It's a pleasure having you here. First, I want to congratulate you on the Golden Globe nominations for Melissa McCarthy as Best Actress and Richard E. Grant for Best Supporting Actor. How did you feel when you heard that news? Oh, my God. It's a, it's a fantastic day because, uh, you know, they, they both so deserve uh, this n- nomination. Um, and I also worked on this TV show called Succession which also got a Golden Globe nomination for Kieran Culkin as an actor. Oh, wow. Fantastic. I know. So today is a terrific day for me. Yes, <laughs> um, it is. Very happy about it. Very exciting. Well, of course, this movie, I mean, I love this movie. I, I, well, I'm a huge fan of both Melissa McCarthy and Richard E. Grant. I first fell in love with Richard E. Grant when I saw With Nell and I a million years ago. And yeah. Melissa McCarthy is just a, a, a comic genius. But this role was so completely different for her. And she did such a magnificent job with it. And the chemistry between Richard E. Grant and her were just, um, it was just uh, amazing. Tell me a little bit about how you as an editor affects performances such as theirs. Yes, well, you know, Richard and Melissa, their chemistry was just so amazing that, you know, when we were looking at the, the first cut of the film, which was a good hour longer than the, the version of the movie that you see, um, it just became so clear that their chemistry was so important that we needed to really kind of focus on their relationship. Um, you know, there were a whole lot of other scenes in the movie and, and lots of other parts and pieces where we spend a lot of time with other characters and we had to actually remove a large chunk in the beginning because we wanted to get Melissa and Richard together as soon as possible Um, because every time we screened the movie everybody reacted in the audience so well to their to their uh, scenes and of course their scenes were incredibly fun to cut because they just you know they worked off of each other and there was a great combination of humor and drama and sadness they kind of went through every possible emotion in their scenes and of course they were just a lot of fun i can imagine i could i would love to be a a fly on the wall during the filming of this movie to see because they're both very funny people i would love to have seen what that would have been like to have watched them both on the set i i read that they only met like the night like friday before the shooting began on on monday or something like that is that they didn't had, did not have time to really develop that chemistry, but there was an instantaneous chemistry that developed between the two of them. Is that true? Oh, yes, that's that's definitely true. And then while they were shooting, it was she's such an incredibly busy person and so versatile. I mean, she's an amazing comedian, of course. Um, on the weekends, she was doing the Sean Spicer imitation on SNL. So yes. she would come do all the footage, you know, work all week. And then on the weekend, she would, you know, Saturday go off to SNL and record this incredible imitation of Sean Spicer that was so popular. Um, but I think, you know, she's just a very warm actor, you know, I think, and very generous to the other people she works with. Um, so I think that she immediately had a connection with Richard. And they're both very generous with each other on screen. So I think that that kind of warmed up their performance and created that delightful chemistry. How did you, you said the film was an hour longer than what we, than the actual movie. What, how, that's a lot of editing. So what, how did you decide what to edit? I know it was, you, it's very difficult. I mean, usually on a movie, your assembly is going to be a lot longer because you never want it to be too short because you want to shape the movie. I mean, the edit is really another rewrite of the movie because, you know, you spend a lot of time reshaping and you hope to have a lot more. On this film, there was an embarrassment of riches. There was so much great material and it was so beautifully shot by Brandon Trost as well. Um, there's a lot of great stuff. You know, in the beginning, 
there was a lot more material where you saw Melissa McCarthy's character struggling. And there was a few scenes where she had another job and you saw how desperate she was becoming and, you know, that she was incapable of really doing any other kind of work except for writing. And we realized as we were cutting the movie that, uh, you know, a little bit goes a long way. You wanted to see that she was desperate, but you didn't need to see all the scenes um, that showed that she was having a hard time finding work. And the other thing is we did a lot of reordering of the scene of the movie as well they were, like when you do, look when i work we put scene cards up on the wall i'm actually in the cutting room right now i'm working with the same director on the mr rogers movie the tom hanks mr rogers movie yeah and i'm talking about that go ahead yes yes yeah, so we're up on the wall there's like all these scene cards with numbers and pictures of what all the scenes are and then as you're cutting you start rearranging them and on uh, Can You Ever Forgive Me, like our scene order became like 1, 6, 42, 39, <laughs> because you had to kind of, as you took things out, you had to kind of move things around to kind of reshape it. And as I say, like the, the edit is some, you know, very much like another write, writing of the movie. You know, you have the original script and you have the shoot, and then the edit is sort of like the third rewrite. Um, kind of like you're putting pieces of the puzzle together. Absolutely. And like, what can you get away with? Do you need to see all of this scene? Or can you get out of the scene a lot earlier? Um, you know, or can you start the scene in the middle? You, you know, you spend a lot of time thinking how much, how much can you still understand? And how, when do you need to put more beats into a scene to really feel what's going on? Um, but honestly, this movie, there was tons of great material. It was actually really difficult to get rid of some of it. Well, I'm really glad that you didn't belabor her um, struggle to get work. I think it was just enough. I, I really do. I think we got, we got, we understood it. We understood what she was going through and how difficult it was for her. And I think any more might have been too much. Absolutely. And you, you need to see like her relationship with her cat. You need to see that she couldn't pay her rent. But there was a whole nother bunch of scenes that were actually quite wonderful and funny with Jennifer Westfeld, where she went and worked for her as like a rich, a rich lady. Um, and it was very funny. Um, but you just, you kind of wanted to get to the moment where she met Jack. So we pulled up that scene a lot. So you'd meet, she'd meet Jack a lot earlier. And you also needed to get to, get to the scene with Jane Curtin, which I, I, which I love that scene as well. And Jane, I'm a huge Jane Curtin fan. Um, so you need to kind of get to that scene too. You really learn about like where, where she had been, what her past had been as a, a successful writer and what she needed to do. Um, so Jennifer Westfeld ended up in the cutting room floor, as they say. Yeah, she did, but not because of any reason of her not doing a good job, because she was right. really funny, and she's a wonderful right. actress. It's just like yeah. sometimes you have to do, you know, like they say, kill your darlings. You know, you have to kind of take out pieces of movies that just, you need to move the story forward. And I think it became clear that, uh, you know, it's not really a buddy movie. It has a lot of different pieces to it. There's little elements of a romantic comedy because with her relationship with Anna, but then that doesn't go well. There's elements of a heist movie. There's elements of the um, buddy movie with Richard, of course. Um, but you know, you had to kind of you have to kind of get going sometimes on the story, and you don't want to waste too much time showing like, oh, she's really unhappy. Yes, I mean we got, and as I said, it, we we you get that when you watch the movie, it, what what was going on in her life and how difficult it was, but how she was desperate and why she decided to do what she did do, uh, which is a very a wonderful. It's a wonderful movie. I, I love the way it was shot. I love the feel oh, I think of the movie. It's so beautifully shot. He did such a great job, and I think people too also like really relate to. You know, you want to see that she's not doing well because I think a lot of people can relate to what that's like and what it's like to be lonely. Um, but then you want to see her start her kind of interesting, unusual friendship she has with Richard. And that's the kind of friendship you don't normally see on screen. Um, you know, that's sort of two oddballs and her partner in crime. And, and, you know, I really love that aspect of the movie. I did too. I, I lived in New York during that time period. Oh, so, really? Yeah, I, I did. That's 
<laughs> so it definitely brought back a lot of memories in the way that it was filmed and it was you know again you know it's not a period piece but in a way it is you know you think oh it's not that long ago when we think okay 1991 isn't that long ago and yet in reality it is and so um and that there is a different feel and i think one of the things i read was uh some of the bookstores that you wanted to use in the film uh were closing you know, you had picked, I guess maybe the, yes. the location town had picked some uh, bookstores that they wanted to include and they closed before you started filming. I mean, that's so sad. I know, it's like a disappearing world, as well as those bars. A lot of those bars are disappearing. And, you know, it's funny, it isn't that long ago, but there really was a different feel because people didn't have cell phones. And right. Julius Bar, which, which is the main bar where they go hang out, which mm -hmm. we, the cutting room, we all took a trip down there, a little you know, exploratory <laughs> trip down to the bar. To, and we ran into people that actually knew Lee. Um, and had drinks with them and it was really fun. But you know, like that bar, they, they have a television there in there now and they had to remove that for, for shooting. And you, you know, you realize like, yeah, every single bar now has a TV in it, which was not the case back then. No. Um, and there was more focus on like the jukebox and the music that was playing. Um, well that's another aspect of this film that's really wonderful. The music, I love the music, uh, all of it. I mean, it was just, it's, it's a seat. It's, I would definitely want to go buy the CD to this, you know, movie because it's so great. But Paul, uh, the, the, the Paul Simon's uh, resurgence of the, the song that's, I can't remember the title, of the, but what's the title of the song? And it's Oh, yeah. No, I know which one you mean. I can't off the top of my head. But yes, yes, that sort of placed it in the era. But a lot of the music in the movie, there was a couple of songs like the Pixies that were from the era. Um, but there was a lot of music, which was Lee's music, um, the, the type of music that she listens to, you know, like that was the real Lee Israel had that particular kind of taste of the sort of jazz singers like Billie Holiday, um, Dinah Washington and Blossom Deary. That was her taste. Um, mm -hmm. And we got a list of, of songs from people who knew her of what kind of music she liked to listen to. So that's why there's a lot of that kind of music in the movie. So it sort of like represents what she loved and what she's yearning for and from a different era, you know, music of a different time, which is, uh, which was a lot of fun playing. Well, we spent a lot of time putting songs in and then trying another one. And, it, and it be, you know, like a lot of that music can be very um, bouncy and up, but we kind of lean towards the kind of more yearning music because it felt like it was an expression of Lee's romanticism. She's a very difficult character with other people, but she has a sort of inner romanticism that kind of comes through with her taste in music. And again, it played beautifully. I mean, I loved, I loved hearing all of that wonderful music. Did, when you were editing, did you use um, music at all when you were going through the editing process or do you not use music? I always, I always use music. I mean, I, I understand the, the idea that you don't want to cut a scene to music to start, but when I'm creating my assembly, I definitely put in a temp score. I mean, like that Pixie song was in my assembly from the beginning. Um, you know, I was already trying to put in songs and get a sense of, and we had a list already of all the songs that Lee liked. So quite a few like Blossom Deary songs and things were there from the very beginning. I, I don't actually want to cut scenes to the music but i use them when i'm trying to present the cut i try to get like pretty far advanced with like sound effects and music to kind of really try to make the cut work and show how it really already is a movie and not just like a bunch of rough scenes stuck together how do you decide when or where to make an edit it's definitely like a, a gut feeling i think it's an instinct um <clears throat> you know sometimes i try to think a little bit of uh, musically, you know, about the way scenes work, because I think rhythm and, you know, like I, I'm very into music and I listened to tons of music growing up and I come from a family of musicians and I like to say that I don't think that editors have to be musicians, but it's good if you are really into music because editing has a lot of relation to music. Um, sometimes when you're cutting, you want to kind of change up the rhythm. You want to stick
stick with a certain pace and then you want to change it up like the same way like a set list or an LP where you don't have just eight slow songs in a row you want to have a slow song and then a fast song and so sometimes when you're editing you're thinking in those terms and then obviously you're thinking about performance and you're combing through and going back and through many many different types of performances um, to see what you think is working best and you don't want to necessarily cut away if something's going really well like there's an example of that in the movie when in the courtroom scene Melissa McCarthy does this amazing job an amazing performance and and it seemed very clear that we shouldn't cut away from her we should let her do her performance we don't need to cut it up Um, it was quite powerful I thought to just stay on her and let her become emotional and you see the gradual way that it changes there you know you could have like cut away let's lose two lines here but when we left it long and left it just staying on her you know you kind of really felt her transformation and so sometimes it's good to not cut so much yeah i i agree with you that was very emotional um the scene that was very emotional for me was the the last time she saw jack Yes, that yeah, of that scene was definitely very much edited. Um, I mean, the performances were all great, but like that, we carefully, I mean, obviously with Mari Heller, the director, the two of us, you know, went through every single performance and we kind of reshaped that scene and found all the beats because it, there was a lot of complicated different emotions, you know, going through in that scene. I mean, you start off with them being very distrustful of each other, and then there's some humor, and then there's sadness, and then there's like these, this incredible moment where they both start to laugh with the sadness. And, um, and that's actually like one of my favorite parts of the movie. Oh, my and dear. also that feeling too, when you have that friend that you just laugh so much with that you burst, you know, you start crying because you you have that connection. And it's, I think it's very powerful at that moment in the film for the audience to see Lee and Jack have that connection again where they can both laugh so hard that the tears come to their eyes, you know? Yeah, I agree with you, especially after everything they went through. If you're just joining us right now, my guest today is Anne McCabe, and we're discussing her new movie, Can You Ever Forgive Me? And um, so I want to ask you, how do you prepare to start to edit a movie? Um, well, usually, you know, my first step is getting the job, which is like I read the script several times and go into interview and speak to the director and you feel like if you're having the right kind of connection and they, they hire you and they want to hire you. So um, in the beginning, I'm mostly uh, preparing and thinking about the script, but then I'm just cutting as they shoot. And like I say, you know, like I make scene cards Um, for every single scene and put it up in the wall and start looking at it and try as soon as possible to make a version of the movie, which is quite long. It's the assembly. It's going to be kind of, you know, much longer than any movie you're ever going to want to watch. But I try to keep everything in and try to keep it as close to the script as possible for that first pass so that, you know, you have that version. But then once we're finished shooting, we start to really... uh, dig in and reshape the film and occasionally i will also like do alt alt versions of scenes like okay i'm doing a very much like the script version of the scene but then i might on the side do another version of the scene that like i already know that we might want to change something or shape something differently or take some lines out um but you know like you're mostly diving in and then i'm also speaking to the director on the phone and i send scenes sometimes while they're shooting especially if you think that there's some kind of problem, um, which there wasn't on this one, but like you might want to see how things are going, you know, the director. So I'll send something so they can get a, like a sense of how the things are getting cut together. Who has the final cut, you or the director? The director, um, you know, it's different on television than on movies, but uh, on movies, I do a a pass of the film and then they come in and we work together um, to create what what is the the director's cut and that's the next phase. And so, but it's a very collaborative um, process. It's different with different directors, but Mari is is an incredible director to work with. It's like the best kind of cutting room because she's 
very smart, has a, lo a great intuitive sense of performances and does a wonderful job working with actors and creating shots. She really knows what she's doing, but she's also interested to hear, you know, opinions and what you have to say. Um, so, I mean, that's like, it's like the kind of thing where you're speaking to somebody and they're so clever that you start feeling more clever and you start bouncing ideas off of each other and how about this and how about that? And that's, you know, that's what the best kind of cutting room should be where you're working together. You know, it's not a competition of who, who is right or, you know, that was my idea. It's more like, wow, what about this? What about that? And you, you know, that, that's how this job was. Very collaborative, which is the best way to work. Well, you're working with Mariel Heller now on the new untitled uh, film about Mr. Rogers starring Tom Hanks. And, and Mariel Heller right now is, seems to be the hot director of the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and deservedly so. Yes. She's yes. really something. She's got an incredible sense, um, you know, of, of, of how to do things differently and, and do a story that you've never seen before. And this uh, Mr. Rogers movie is a, a lot of fun, very different from Can You Ever Forgive Me? Um, incredibly creative and interesting in a, in a whole new way. So uh, I can't wait for everybody to see this one. I'm excited about that too. Can you tell tell us a little bit about working on that film and, and editing Tom Hanks and Matthew Rise, who I love too? Oh yeah, I mean, what a thrill to be cutting Tom Hanks. I mean, really. Of all. <laughs> and Matthew Reese, who's also up for a, a Golden Globe for the Americans, so so that's yes. great. It's a wonderful cast, including Chris Cooper, who is really great. Oh, I love him well. too. Um, they you know they shot the movie out in Pittsburgh. It has a completely different look from. Uh, can you ever forgive me? And uh, I love that about Mari. Mari is that she, you know, she's not, never interested in repeating herself in any way. So you know, it has a lot about the show and super colorful and just a completely different vibe. But it's really fun and lots of music as well. Very different kind of music than from Can You Ever Forgive Me, um, but also wonderful. Yeah, I'm really excited about this one. Yeah, I, I am too. Do, do they have a release date yet? And have they given it a, a title yet? Uh, no, it's still up in the air about the title. I think they're planning to release it actually next October. So we'll see. In time for the award season to begin. <laughs> yes, <laughs> great. 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 Well, what made you decide to become a film editor, Anne? Um, well, it, you know, it's interesting. I studied English at the... Uh, Barnard College in Columbia, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and I kind of fell into the film business because I knew some people who worked on it. And um, But I think, you know, I worked as a PA, I worked for casting, I worked uh, for a screenwriter, and I did a lot of stuff on set. But I finally, my first reason for going into the cutting room is that the hours weren't quite as long as, the, <laughs> as on set. But um, very quickly I realized that I really enjoyed the, the whole process of shaping story and how much it re you know related to music um, something you know two things that I'm very much interested in and I realized like you just had a lot it was another way to rewrite the movie and have a lot of creative input well I look forward to seeing your future movies and I thank you so much for being on the show today my guest today has been again. You're welcome. My guest today has been Anne McCabe, who is the editor of Can You Ever Forgive Me and the upcoming Mr. Rogers movie starting, starring Tom Hanks. On Power Talk AM 1460 and FM 101.1, streaming worldwide on iHeartRadio, Jan Price talks to the movers and shakers in the film business. The Jan Price Show. Tired of looking at your worn wood floors? Mr. Sandless can bring them back to life again. That's right. It's Mr. Sandless, the no sanding solution to beautiful wood floors. Mr. Sandless is clean, efficient, contains no harmful chemicals, and is certified green. Mr. Sandless refinishes all hardwoods, softwoods, engineered flooring, and laminates. Most jobs are completed in one day with no cleanup required ever. 
with virtually no odor and is safe for pets and kids. No need to move out or even leave the house. Mr. Sandless is the company that invented Sandless Refinishing and is the largest floor refinishing company in the world. Over 120,000 happy customers, guaranteed adhesion, guaranteed satisfaction, and a five-year warranty. Call Mr. Sandless today at 831-747-7476. That's 747-7476 or MrSandless.com. That's MrSandless.com. 